Today we're talking about why I upgraded from my main camera for sports videography for over two years to this, the Sony A7 IV. Hey, what's going on? My name is Peter Sorellis. I'm a videographer and editor from Toronto, Canada. I specialize in sports videography. And like I said, we're gonna be talking about this bad boy, the Sony a7 IV, and why I think it's a sweet camera for sports videography, and why I pushed my a7 III, which I was very comfortable with and producing, in my opinion, pretty high quality work with, down to my B cam, so that I could run this camera as my everyday driver. Now I did buy the Sony a7 IV with the kit lens. I don't plan on using the kit lens, which you can see here for very much apart from like just regular non-professional usage. Like if I go on trips with my family and stuff, I want to go over some of the features in the a7 IV that convinced me to purchase this camera, not only as an upgrade from the a7 III, but also over the a7s3 the fx3 or the fx6 given their respective price points and the features that are packed into each one for my specific needs creating sports videos so i managed to actually use this camera a little bit on a recent road trip that i did just to get some test shots nothing related to sports videography or anything but the first thing that i noticed out of this and one of the main reasons why i wanted to pick it up was the 10-bit 422 color it is such a notable improvement over the a7 III to be able to use a camera like this where you can push the colors so much and actually shoot in log profiles like S-Log3 without worrying about your image breaking down. The level of creativity and control that you get over your image when you properly expose and do everything correctly in this camera versus when you do everything correctly in the a7 III it's like not even comparable. It's absolutely night and day. I feel like that quality and the richness in the colors that you're capable of achieving with this camera that you could get, I guess, in the a7 III but didn't have the flexibility to always dial in the way you exactly wanted, that characteristic is going to be a huge game changer for my work. It's something that I've already noticed just going through like the little test footage stuff that I shot and in past footage that I've edited from this camera, from other shooters. And like, it's really the main thing that convinced me to get this camera. I am so psyched to have this for sports videos for the next months and probably at least a couple of years and to share that awesome content with you with the better colors that I'm now able to produce in my work thanks to this camera. Another feature that completely won me over from buying the a7 IV as an upgrade from the a7 III is the fact that I can now shoot slow motion in 4K. Now, obviously this camera does not have the same 4K slow motion capabilities as the a7S III. The a7S III can do 4K in 120 frames per second uncropped, which is pretty ridiculous. And I've worked with that footage before and it looks great, but honestly, it's kind of, overkill in my opinion if you're just posting your stuff on the internet given the compression that your footage already goes through on the internet I, I i guess it's a nice thing to have but in my opinion is it worth the huge file sizes that come with shooting 4k 120 frames per second in 10 bit 42 color not not always not always in my opinion so the kind of the sweet spot for me was here the a7 IV, where if I want slow motion in 4K, I can shoot 4K at 60 frames per second in APS-C mode and get that. And I still have the option to shoot 120 frames per second, either in full HD just regularly or in S and Q mode. So I can still get the 120 frame per second look that is so important for sports videos where shooting at high frame rates and utilizing slow motion for key moments is just so important. But I don't need to deal with the crazy huge file sizes of 4K 120 on the A7S III. A lot of the time when I'm filming sports videos, I'm making edits quickly. Sometimes I'm doing them in game during timeouts between quarters at halftime. And I can't get into a proxy workflow when I have to work that quickly. If I'm working with 4K 120 footage, it just doesn't always make sense to me. So I didn't think I really needed to spend the extra money to get that feature. And I think that I'm going to be able to shoot great slow motion content either in 4K or in full HD 
for my work with this camera. And honestly, I think that for right now, it more than covers my needs. Now, there are a lot of features that I could talk about in the a7 IV that were vastly improved versus the a7 III that I had been using previously. But one of the first things that I noticed when I held this camera and started fidgeting with it a little bit were the ergonomics. And like there were a lot of ergonomic features that I noticed and really liked in this camera that I wish I had had previously. So I'm actually just gonna refer to my notes and I'll go over all of the ergonomic features that I absolutely love to make sure I don't miss any. And then we can talk about them a little bit more. So the a7 IV, it has a shutter cover when I remove the lens, which is awesome because I found that pretty frequently I would do a lens change really quickly at a game and a little bit of dust would get on my center and I'd have like black spots on my image sometimes, which sucked. So I'm super happy I don't really need to deal with that anymore. There's also, as many of you may know, a new and improved menu system in the a7 IV and also in the a7S III and the FX3 and a lot of the newer Sony cameras that I think is just much more intuitive and much easier to navigate than the previous menu system that you could find in the a7 III. There is also a second dial and it's lockable and controllable. On the a7 III, it used to be the exposure compensation dial, which I literally never used, but now we have this dial right here. So you can twist it and assign it to any value you want, such as ISO or white balance. And if you click the top button right here, like that, then it's locked into place and you can't move it anymore. So I've got this custom map to my white balance so I can make quick white balance adjustments on the fly. And then to make sure that I don't mess with that button, I can just lock it in and my white balance is set, which I have been loving. This camera also has port doors that don't dangle. It was super hard and just like annoying to plug in microphones, headphones, anything else that had to go into the side of this camera when I was working because the ports would just dangle off the side on the a7 III. But here you can see that I'm opening all the ports and they're just open and not dangling. So it's really easy for me to open and close them and there's little tabs that I can control everything with. It's really, really nice, honestly. One thing that I also have to talk about is this flip screen right here. It's so much better than the tilting screen in my opinion. And one thing that really bugged me about the a7 III, actually while I was setting up this shot, it was bugging me because every time I do something like this, I have to set up the camera, click record, sit here, see if I'm framed right, and then go back and check and adjust my framing. Now I can just see it, not to mention this tilt screen helps with low angle shots tremendously. I loved having this when I had my very first DSLR camera, the Canon T3i. I loved having it on my Canon 77D that I had years ago. And when I jumped to the a7 III and lost that tilting screen, I was really disappointed. So I'm super happy to have it back on this camera. This camera also has touch tracking autofocus, which for sports is super cool because I can turn it on and then touch the subject with the ball or touch the star player who I'm filming, who I want to track throughout my shot. And the camera will just do it, which is kind of unbelievable. It's basically Tesla autopilot for cameras, in my opinion. So I'm super excited to put that to the test. It's not something I really thought about when buying the camera, but once I saw it was in there, I started to think of all the possibilities that it could be used for, for sports videography specifically, and it got me really excited. This camera also has a full-size HDMI port, which I will show you right here, which is awesome because one, when I plugged in external monitors to the micro HDMI port of the a7 III, I felt like they weren't always securely in and the cable would get loose and sometimes be wiggly and it would cut off my connection to my monitor sometimes, which is super disappointing. So I'm hoping that this allows that connection to be more secure. And also it's just easier for me to find and use cables. Like I don't have HDMI to micro HDMI cables just laying around, but I've got a ton of HDMI cables and I can use any one of them in this camera and it's gonna work just fine. So that's very convenient and kind of in the same boat, this camera is a lot easier to use as a webcam, which I know is a feature that not a lot of people might care about, but I work from home and I think a lot of other people have moved to work from home recently. So you find yourself in a lot of video meetings to know that I can just plug this camera into my computer and it will act as an easy webcam for me and be recognized easily without any additional software is awesome because it's just gonna make my video calls look that much better and I'll seem like that much more of a professional when I'm working. Maybe that's just me being a nerd, but it makes me really happy and I'm gonna try using this as a webcam. 
I think it's a really awesome feature that's worked in here that I can do that more easily. Now, there were some other features in this camera that I liked and that were big improvements from the a7 III, but weren't necessarily determining factors in my purchase, like the 33 megapixel sensor for photography, because I don't do that much photography, or the S10 tone picture profile, which looks great in my opinion and basically requires no color grading, but that I don't necessarily think that I'll be using in professional scenarios. Maybe I'll start using it for YouTube or scenarios where I have to turn projects around very quickly. But at the end of the day, this camera is a huge improvement in video compared to the a7 III. And even though it doesn't have some of the high frame rate modes in 4K that the a7S III or the FX3 have, in my opinion, it is still an awesome camera at the price point. I think that it's a super good tool for sports videographers considering the ergonomics, the color, and some of the options you have for recording. And for $1,000 less than the a7S III to get the quality that is packed into this thing, like if you're creating sports videos that go on the internet, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but I definitely think that this is something you should consider and that's why I bought it. Anyways, if you like this video, please make sure to subscribe to the channel because I post videography and video editing tips and tutorial videos, sometimes talking about gear on a regular basis and I'd love to have you around for that. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, drop them in the comment section. I'd love to have a chat with you down there. And uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to plug. So that's going to be all for today. Till next time, peace.